Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Mark Crispin Miller. This is um, the first Tuesday event for November, and it happens to fall on a first Tuesday, right? It's one way in which this evening is extremely appropriate. It's election day. Um, I had my vote stolen today. Uh, maybe you did too. Um, and it's an election in which there are a considerable number of uh, candidates running out there of the uh, radical Christianist persuasion, uh, candidates with a kind of theocratic agenda. People are talking back there. Is that allowed? <laughs> I guess there's nothing we can do about it. Um, thanks. So it's yeah, more than appropriate that we have back with us again tonight two uh, authors uh, whose subject is this very problem. We have both uh, Damon Linker and Jeff Charlotte with us tonight. We've had them in the past, and we're very lucky to have them again. Uh, Damon Linker uh, is the author of a previous book called The Theocons. He had been editor of this uh, journal, First Things, uh, a kind of uh, neoconservative Catholic journal, and saw that whole world from the inside, then wrote a book about it, has a new book out called The Religious Test, which is a, a, a brilliant, sophisticated plea for a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of tolerance, which I'll explain. We also, have with us Jeff Charlotte, who's the author of the book The Family. Uh, just as Damon was a kind of an insider in, in his wing of the Christianist movement, Jeff also uh, penetrated this townhouse in Washington, D.C., where a number of Christianist candidates hung their hats and wrote this book, The Family, about that um, sort of radical um, evangelical movement at the top a radical movement at the top. He has a new book out uh, on the same general subject called C Street. So they're both going to talk uh, according to our usual custom informally for 15 or 20 minutes each and then they will um, take your questions. So please turn off your cell phones, okay? Uh, and this is very important this being an independent bookstore, and these being uh, authors with something serious to say, you must consider buying their books and having them sign copies of them afterward, okay? Don't go checking out the book and then go order it on Amazon. It's not fair, and you won't get the signature. So I thought we would start with Damon simply because Catholicism precedes radical Protestantism historically, obviously. Um, so please uh, join me in first welcoming uh, Damon Linker. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, both for the introduction and for the invitation to come back. Um, I'm happy to be here. It's a great bookstore, and, uh, and uh, its name doesn't uh, start with a B, so that's, that's good and quite rare. Um, Let's see, let me just check my time so I know when to shut up. Um, I, I won't talk uh, that long. I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of, of my book and what I see as its contribution to our thinking about the place of religion in our nation's politics. Uh, it's a topic that I think is uh, an important one and one that, is to, in my judgment, we don't uh, engage with intelligently enough. I think there are a couple of things uh, that are just simply true that we need to treat as our starting point in thinking about religion and politics in America, and that is one, uh, America is a very religious country overall. Uh, there are a lot of very religious people in the country. The forms it takes varies a lot. It changes over time. but. I began my book from an assumption, let's just assume that religion is here to stay. Um, and, uh, you know, this places me at, at somewhat odds with, say, some of the new atheist types, people like uh, Dawkins and Hitchens and so forth, who Sam Harris 
uh, who seem to kind of assume that if we, uh, if we come at religion aggressively enough, we might somehow wipe it out. Uh, that I don't think is very realistic, at least in the short or medium term, so I, I don't assume that's possible. And then once we recognize that religion is here to stay, uh, then I think the next step is to realize that there are different kinds of religion and that not all kinds of religion are equally problematic when it comes to liberal democratic politics. So the kind that I focus on in my book are, is the kind of religion that is most uh, troubling or difficult to synthesize with democracy, and that is what I call traditionalist religion. And, uh, and then the third thing, the last in my list, uh, that uh, I kind of, my background assumptions in writing the book, is that there are many kinds of traditionalist religion. Each faith community has its own form of traditionalism. And each problem posed by these different faith communities, the traditionalist communities, is different. And so my book is a series of thematic chapters that look at points of tension between different traditionalist religious groups and democratic norms. So, uh, for instance, to give you a taste of what I'm talking about, uh, my second chapter is about authority, claims to authority. And that talks about a little bit about evangelical Protestantism, uh, the fact that individual evangelical Protestants very often uh, have a kind of longing for authority uh, in their faith, but in politics, I think even more so, to have a kind of leader to follow. You saw some of this with George W. Bush uh, in, uh, the, in the last decade. Um, then I look at uh, the Catholic Church and the fact that it is a hierarchical, authoritarian institution. Uh, this took one form before Vatican II. We saw this with uh, JFK's political campaign uh, for president in 1960, where he was asked what I claim in the book are perfectly, at the time, were perfectly legitimate questions about what it would mean to elect someone to the nation's highest office uh, who was a member of a church whose leader was thought to have authority derived directly from Jesus Christ and who held at the time that liberal democracy was a, a political and moral abomination. What would that mean? Um, this changed somewhat after Vatican II uh, because the church did soften a lot of its opposition for liberal democracy. But as I talk about there, as I talked about in my previous book, the Theocons, the post-Vatican II Catholic Church has shifted to a new position that holds that true American democracy or true American liberalism is actually perfectly harmonious with the moral teaching of the Catholic Church. And once you make that assumption, then every divergence from Catholic teaching in American politics is something uh, to be not only lamented, but opposed very aggressively, uh, as we see these days when the church comes out very strongly against uh, Catholic politicians who diverge from the church's teaching, especially on sexual issues. Um, and then finally, the authority chapter looks at uh, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, which is the Mormon church. And that, the Mormon church presents real, uh, very interesting challenges for democratic politics because Mormons claim to believe that the leader of their church who works in an office building in Salt Lake City is a prophet of God. He is God's mouthpiece on earth. That means that out of six billion people on the planet and 300 million people in the United States, there is one human being, the head of their church, who essentially has a red phone to God. Now, what would it mean to have a person elected to the nation's highest office who believed that there was one person out of 300 million people in the United States who had authority and information potentially, edicts perhaps handed down directly from the deity that no one can challenge because no one else has that stature as a prophet. So though that, that's an example of what I mean by tensions between liberal democratic norms and the requirements of traditionalist religious belief. If you are a devout Mormon, you believe that that is who the, the head of their church is. He is a prophet of God. What I'm trying to get at in the book is that if we want to have an intelligent discussion about the fact that religion is here and it's not going to go away, 
What we as citizens need to do is to insist that our politicians not only get the benefits electorally of invoking their religious faith every chance they get. We say to them in effect, okay, you want to bring religion in? You want to put politics on? You want to put religion on the table of public discussion? Okay, let's have a conversation. Let's ask uh, the, the, the next Mormon candidate, probably Mitt Romney in two years. Over the next two years, we'll be running for president. Let's ask him questions, not disrespectful questions. Some people raised when he ran the last time, well, don't Mormons wear secret underwear? Uh, it's true, uh, devout Mormons do wear kind of undergarments with symbols on them. I don't see how that's politically relevant. I mean, all religions believe things that sound bizarre to people who aren't members of those faiths. That's not politically relevant, really. But it is relevant if Mitt Romney actually believes that the head of his church is a prophet of God. You can very clearly see how that could lead to all kinds of weird questions about what would happen if that prophet issued an edict that appeared to clash with his presidential duties. That's perfectly appropriate. Um, other chapters in the book look at, um, for instance, uh, the fact that over the last a couple of centuries, evangelical Protestants have tended to be, uh, I'm, I'm well liked by an insect, um, uh, have, evangelical Protestants have tended to be very drawn to arguments that aren't per se anti-science in their own minds. The, the interesting thing about evangelical Protestants' views of science is not that mo most of them don't say, and it would be actually much easier for us as critics to, if they said, you know, um, the Bible says this, the earth is 6,000 years old, and therefore science is an abomination, I'm not gonna study it. Uh, science is an example of human pride. What science says is nonsense, I'm just gonna read the Bible. If they said that, then I, I actually personally, I would have a kind of respect for that and say, all right, you're consistent, you're saying science bad, this book good. In reality, most evangelicals, and especially those who are somewhat educated, take a much more, I think, pernicious view, which is actually that their view is true science. That this, that this actually to read the Bible as a literal account is the true science. And I actually, to tell you a funny story, I had a very unpleasant, uh, but amusing to you, experience on the radio recently. Uh, I just did a radio tour to promote the book and everything went swimmingly. I was on right wing shows, left wing shows, centrist shows, conservative shows, uh, liberal shows, uh, you know, uh, religious, non-religious, all kinds, all fine. I can parry and bob and weave with the best of them. But then the last one was on a radio station somewhere in the Midwest and I get on the phone and the guy said, the only thing he wants to talk about is the chapter of my book where I talk about the anti-intellectualism of a certain kind of evangelical Protestant because he says he's one of them and he's a scientific, scientifically serious believer in creationism. And he starts talking about how Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, roamed the earth in the time of Marco Polo and carbon dating is a sham and I read this book and this scientist is on my side and this and the other thing. And I didn't know what to say exactly. I mean, what do you say? Again, if he had said um, science is, is an abomination, it's the devil, we're actually, instead, we're going to read the Bible and the Bible alone, then I, again, I would have, I would say, okay, that's fine. Let's talk about something else. You're in one world, I'm in another. But he was professing that he was the true scientist and I was the dogmatist because I dogmatically sided with the 99.9% .9 of working scientists in the world. Um, and so I ended up hanging up on him because there was nothing to be said. Uh, and then one of the people who was uh, listening to his show uh, gave my book its first Amazon rating, uh, a one star, and didn't refer to the radio show, just said that I'm completely dogmatic and I'm not serious and not open to different points of view and so forth. So that's my funny story. Um, anyway, so that's what one chapter of the book is about. And, and I, I look there at, this is a very old, very long, complicated story going way back. Uh, into even before the, the founding of the country, that there was a, there grew up in America a style of evangelical uh, faith that tends to view um, av average intuition of average people as the ultimate arbiter of truth. Uh, 
So it holds that kind of, if your common sense tells you that Jesus Christ is Lord, then that's good enough as an appeal. And, uh, and so if I read the Bible and I feel a kind of burning inside me that makes me think it's true, that means it is true because I feel it and my friends feel it. And that is somehow genuine science to kind of take an opinion poll of people's feelings. Uh, that's crudely put, but that's kind of the view that I look at in that book. And I talk about the danger for democracy of having people making these kinds of appeals to truth. Um, I then I have a chapter about providence and the, the tendency of American public figures to see God's hand at work in American history and our actions in the world um, and, and the dangers of doing that. Uh, I also have a chapter about um, uh, the religious right and the culture war, uh, which uh, it, it, I treat the religious right as a kind of interdenominational coalition of traditionalist believers. So it's basically conservatives in all the different faith communities. And I talk about there how the, the, um, the religious right and the, the, uh, the opposition to things like abortion and gay marriage is itself a response to the breakdown of a consensus in America about these matters. I kind of concede the point uh, to some people on the religious right in that chapter and say, you know what, up till about 50 years ago in this country, we were a traditionalist country. We did, for the most part, believe that traditionalist sexual morality was the truth. Overwhelmingly believed that uh, sodomy in all forms, inside or outside of marriage, was wrong. And that includes masturbation, uh, oral sex, anal sex, in and out of marriage between uh, people of the same uh, sex or different sex, gender, uh, between uh, whether you're married or not, in all cases, bad. And, and even homosexuals themselves internalized this to such an extent that they often lived lives of, of self-loathing because they agreed, yeah, this is terrible that I feel this way, that I have these longings and desires. And in a country where the overwhelming majority of people agree about this, it shouldn't be surprised that the law backed them up, that sodomy was illegal, all the things I listed were illegal and backed up by law in almost every place in the country. The fact is, though, that over the last 50 years, beginning in the 60s, this consensus about traditionalism broke down. It began to break down. And now we're to the point where, I don't know, it depends on how you pose the questions, but basically 25 to 35 percent of Americans claim to abide by the old strictures on sex. In a country where only that many people want the law to back them up, it's not going to. The law very sensibly will back away from enforcing such beliefs. And that's the world we live in now. And what you essentially have in the religious right, uh, you have sexual traditionalists who now want to use the law to enforce what they believe is right about sex when the overwhelming majority of Americans no longer agree. And so what you end up is a part, trying to inf a part of the society trying to enforce its moral view on the whole of society. And liberal democratic law will not do such a thing. Only where there is overwhelming consensus on these matters will the law step in and enforce uh, views about the regulation of personal behavior. And that's the way it should be. To be honest, I don't really believe most people on the religious right would actually go through with this if they actually got the power they seem to crave so much. And why? Because when push comes to shove, they don't want it either. They like their internet porn too. Uh, and, and so it's really, it's not, it's not that clear cut. There are all kinds of strange po uh, political motivations on the part of a lot of these people that it, it, it serves their interest to have this be something they're always striving to achieve and yet never actually reach. Um, in closing, I'll just say, um, that uh, I say some things in the book that are also critical of the new atheists. My final chapter is about the new atheists, where I talk about people like Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, and others, and say that uh, my, my problem with them is not that they're atheists. I don't believe, like religious, many religious believers, that somehow if you're an atheist, you shouldn't be allowed to hold public office. I think that's ridiculous. There's no reason to believe empirically or for any other reason that you can't be moral. And, and a good person if you don't believe in a deity. The problem, in my view, with the new atheists is that they, they are mirror image copies of many of the fundamentalists they're so critical of on the other side. One example, 
Sam Harris writes in The End of Faith, his first book, which kind of launched the New Atheist Movement, he says uh, toward the beginning of that book that um, religious toleration, the principle of religious toleration is a force driving us toward the abyss. In other words, he does not believe we should tolerate people's religious beliefs. And um, I'm very grateful that Richard Dawkins kind of runs with this in his book, The God Delusion. Uh, in one of those, one of the chapters of that book, he says, that um, uh, he, he talks about uh, raising a child in a religious community to believe, uh, to believe in the truth of, say, Catholicism or Mormonism, whatever it is, uh, Orthodox Judaism, uh, that to raise a child within a religious tradition is a form of child abuse. Now, um, what I'm not as impressed with Dawkins about is that he doesn't let the other shoe drop, which is to, to, to go the next step or two and to say, well, wait a minute. We, we throw people in jail for abusing their children. We take their children away from the abuser through social services if that's happening, and good thing too. But if that's the case, and it's the case that religious believers in raising their children to be religious are abusing their children, then shouldn't the state be empowered to remove those children? Shouldn't they, the, the believers be put in jail for trying to raise their children as believers? I don't believe if Bush came to shove, Dawkins would say that, but he's playing with rhetorical fire there and not taking, uh, following through on the implications of what he's saying, and that is illiberal, in the best sense of, of liberalism. I don't mean liberal in the sense, I, I believe you can be politically conservative and be on the, in my opinion, the correct side of these questions. This isn't about ideology of right or left. What it's about is being tolerant in the genuine sense of, of the ancient virtue of liberality, which meant a kind of generosity, openness to complexity, a realization that human life, human experience, human capacity, education, emotional disposition, all of these things are really different from community to community, from person to person. You're not going to get unanimity about the highest good of life, about the meaning of existence. People are going to disagree about that. And our kind of society was originally founded by people in the early modern period who looked out at the religious civil wars of Europe and said, you know what, let's try a different kind of politics where we don't bring those disputes about the highest things into our public life. Actually, we can think anything we want about those things as long as we don't politicize it. And people um, on both sides of these extremes, I think, politicize it in a way that isn't good for any of us, including for religious believers. Because I do think that, uh, like the classical liberals in the early modern period argued, I very much believe that it is better for religious believers to have non-political faith as well. It's better for them. It's better for the for the political system as a whole. So everybody benefits, everybody benefits. So I, in, in a way, I see my book as a very pro-religious book. It's a very anti-political religion book. Um, so there you go, that's my, my summary, and um, I look forward to taking questions later. Thank you, Damon, that was great. Um, and now, um, to help us see just how far uh, a very important uh, arm of this evangelical movement uh, has, has gone and how much they've really accomplished uh, sort of outside or beyond the radar, uh, Jeff Charlotte. Thanks, and uh, thanks, Mark, for having me back. And I, I should say, uh, Mark had me in this series uh, a couple years ago when my last book called The Family came out. And at that point, it was, a, it was an event that you had sort of um, for books that had dropped off the radar completely to sort of try and save them. And it was very, very generous of you. Um, and uh, the book was a history of the, uh, the oldest and I would say the, the most influential Christian conservative political organization um, in, in Washington outside of the, the more formal institutionalized movements, um, this group called The Family or, or The Fellowship. Um, and it did kind of drop, I published it in 2008, it kind of dropped off the radar. And then, um, and as Mark said, I, I was sort of an insider in this group. I, uh, I, I can't claim the, the sort of the years of service uh, that Damon had. 
uh, uh, with theocons, but I'd spent a, a short amount of time living with this group in a house that they had where they're sort of grooming young men for future, uh, future leadership. I was younger at the time. And, um, and so I, they, they have kind of a dumbed down Calvinism, you know, Calvinism, the idea that if you're, you're saved, you're saved, it doesn't matter what you do, you're part of the elect. Um, so I became a member and I became a brother of the family. And um, uh, once, you're, once you're in, you're kind of always in. So now I'm bad brother of the family because I write about them. Um, but I'm still a brother. And so the book had dropped off the radar. Mark tried to help, but even McNally Jackson couldn't save it. Um, uh, but uh, then, uh, then a couple other brothers of the family, I'd like to think they were sitting around, what can we do to help Jeff's book? Um, <laughs> Uh, so brother John Ensign, senator from Nevada, fourth ranking Republican at the time, uh, last summer came out and confessed that he had been having an adulterous affair. Um, always troublesome for a politician, but particularly one who had staked his whole career on uh, this very restrictive idea of family values. And in fact, launched his political career, one of his first moves on getting to Congress was trying to ensure that um, there could, would be no pornography in prison, nor any magazines that one might interpret pornographically. Um, so if you like the ads in Rolling Stone, for instance, forget it. Um, but uh, he had different standards for himself. So. He, he came out and he did this, and suddenly people were sort of interested because he lived in um, this house on C Street, this, this, this place that the, this group maintains to sort of support the congressmen who are part of the movement. And uh, a magazine editor came to me and said, do you want to write about this? And I said, no, I, I, I don't want to write about it. I've written a long book about the history of the organization, and uh, you know, this guy's sexual issues are his own. Um, and it didn't make any bump in the sales for, for the family. So then Governor Mark Sanford said, said he had to step up and he's gonna have to do better than Senator Ensign. Senator Ensign's press conference was two minutes. And if you saw, if you haven't seen Governor Sanford's press conference, it's on YouTube and you really should watch it because it's the best political theater that I've ever seen in, in American life. And I don't mean to suggest that it's insincere, it's deeply sincere, it's, it's, but it's a wonderful performance of a man talking at length about the Appalachian Trail, where he claimed he had been while he had run away from the state of South Carolina, and he's talking about what he likes about the Appalachian Trail, the kinds of things you might see on it, and then kind of scratches his head and says, and also, uh, I betrayed my wife and while I was, I was lying and I was in Argentina the whole time with my mistress. But don't worry, because I'm going to C Street. I'm going to this place in C Street, and they're going to help me out. And says, in fact, they've known about this for quite some time, which... <laughs> <laughs> you can, there's some cringing going on there. Um, and the third guy was a, a, a former congressman, Chip Pickering. Chip Pickering of Mississippi, uh, probably known to you at all, if at all, if you, if you saw Borat, there was a, a sort of an idiot congressman in Borat, the kind of guy, so, so here's Borat and here's his parallel in, in Congress, who was Chip Pickering, um, who was actually not an idiot at all, a very, very bright guy and very politically effective guy, but not but not, um, not well known. He was having his affair. He also lived in the C Street house, um, which is registered as a church, and he was meeting his mistress there. His mistress was an heiress for uh, a telecom heiress. Um, he was on the telecom subcommittee. It was sort of a, a beautiful match, and in 2008, he left Congress to become a telecom lobbyist, working with several of his other C Street brothers. This is how we help each other in the family. Um, so at this point, uh, that helped sales even more than, than Mark's series, uh, um, these guys. And, and, and people started coming to me with uh, uh, whistleblowers within the organization, sharing documents, talking about um, the, the nature of the movement. And I said, well, I, there's, a, there's an opportunity now to sort of write a shorter book that would be about, very much about the present of what this organization is. Um, and, but also not just this organization, but, but to use it as a lens to look at what I see is a sort of the enduring power of fundamentalism in American life. Um, and so, you know, the nexus of all this was this C Street house, this three-story uh, red brick townhouse uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, it's 133 C Street Southeast. I give the address so you can go and visit because it is registered as a church and it's tax exempt as a church, which makes it public. You're allowed to go and visit and you can spend time. Senator Ensign had to move out, but Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina uh, one of the, the sort of the standard bearer now for the Tea Party, um, the establishment side of things. Senator Tom Coburn, uh, the Republican from Oklahoma, is probably most famous for proposing the death penalty for abortion providers. 
Um, uh, Senator Sam Brownback was there. Senator Sam Brownback of Kansas, uh, very conservative, but also a little odd. His, one of his issues is um, uh, destruction of the earth by meteors. I'm not making this up. Um, uh, but he's, he's moving up, he's, he's gonna become governor of Kansas and he's gonna be replaced by Representative Jerry Moran, uh, also of Kansas, a Republican, who also lives in the C Street House, who beat out in a primary representative, Todd Teehart, another Republican who studied at the C Street House. So Kansas is this sort of perfect C Street storm, a state where heads they win, tails they win, it's all C Street. Um, so I decided to, co to come back to this thing. Um, and, and because now there was people were sort of willing to pay attention to it. And, I'll, and to pick up on a point that Damien made about the religious, uh, the, you know, the religious test, this question of, of the legitimacy of asking questions about religion and politics. Um, when I was writing the, the last book, The Family, there was always a certain response that you got from folks that um, isn't inappropriate to ask about the religious lives of politicians, uh, which was always a strange. You take a Senator Coburn or a Senator Brownback um, uh, and they're very clear. They said, I make my decisions based on religion. Senator Brownback, in fact, claims to have only one constituent. He does not refer to the people of Kansas. One constituent. He's, he's very clear on this. So it becomes a very legitimate question to say, well, what does that constituent want? And how do you understand who that constituent is? Um, and uh, um, so, but people, a lot of people in the press, um, for all sorts of reasons in American history and how the press forms and it's sort of a very kind of traditional Protestant sense of itself, we're very skittish about asking those questions. But sex lives of politicians, religious lives, that's off limits, but sex lives, um, that's something we can talk about. And the story blew up, but unfortunately, it did sort of stop there. It stopped mainly with the sex lives of politicians, so much so that uh, one of the scandals, Senator Ensign, is now the subject of a Justice Department uh, investigation that um, uh, has the potential to put Ensign in prison uh, and Senator Coburn who played a role in arranging for uh, payoffs and or, or payments I suppose um, to the uh, the family of the uh, uh, the mistress uh, so two senators could could lose their seats and go to prison that's not as much of a story because it's not sex it's polit it's, it's money it's complicated um, Nonetheless, that's what I decided to look at in the book, to use the, these sex scandals as the departure point and then to follow the money and to follow the ideas out from C Street and out into the world um, very much in the present. Um, the money, for instance, uh, former Congressman Mark Siljander, Michigan, uh, a, a leader of the group, um, uh, pled guilty this past July, actually. So he, he made following the money easy because it was all laid out in a government indictment. Um, uh, for taking money from a banned terrorist organization based in Sudan, uh, laundering it through the family's nonprofit entities, um, and then using it to say what he was really doing was he was writing a book um, uh, called Deadly Misunderstandings, um, one congressman's attempt to build a bridge between Muslims and Christians. It was a one-way bridge. Um, the idea was, he said, that, there, that, that there's no reason for Muslims not to love Jesus and to follow Jesus. They could be messianic Muslims, like Jews for Jesus. Um, meanwhile, he was meeting with guys like Omar al-Bashir, the, the dictator of Sudan, the first sitting head of state ever to be indicted for genocide. And uh, Siljander went over there and met with him and came back and said, you know, he's really misunderstood. I talked to him about Jesus. Um, he's Muslim, but he, we talked about Jesus. And um, uh, uh, I don't think we need sanctions on Sudan. I think the thing in Darfur, that got a little out of hand. But uh, I know this man's heart, and it's a good heart. Um, anyway, the good news there is still Jander faces 15 years in prison. Um, but you follow the money, you come to some sort of ugly places like that. You follow the ideas, the ideas of the group, what's animating still Jander. Um, it's not as cynical an exercise. Siljander, I think to this day, really doesn't believe what he did uh, was a form of corruption. Um, and the ideas of this group were what were ultimately more compelling to, uh, uh, to me. Um, first, one of the ideas that made them complicated and hard to, to study is um, that a proper ministry does not call attention to itself, um, that it stays away from the limelight. That in as much as it institutionalizes itself, um, it becomes vulnerable to all sorts of negative forces. So the leader, the longtime leader of the group says, the more invisible you can make your organization, the more influence it will have, which is true. 
which is again why we have the lobbying laws and disclosure laws that Sil gender ran afoul of. But then you go to the idea, what is their influence? Who is that? It's, it's Jesus, obviously, that one constituent for Senator Brownback. How do they understand? How do they understand Jesus? Um, and, um, uh, and for that, you should go back into the history of the group. They founded uh, in the midst of the Great Depression, which they saw as a punishment from God for the New Deal, for our attempt to regulate the market, for our attempt to presume to uh, redistribute wealth. God chooses who's wealthy. God chooses who's poor. Now, it doesn't mean that the wealthy should be greedy. In fact, they should help the poor. In fact, the best way we can help the weak is by helping the strong. God has chosen those who are going to be in power through wealth or politics. We can help them, we can minister to them, and then they can distribute blessings to the rest of us, a kind of trickle-down religion, a kind of trickle-down fundamentalism. Um, but even that isn't the real sort of core of the idea. Um, who is this God that's going to pick these people? Who is the Jesus who is going to select these men? Um, and that they understand through a model not of mercy or love or justice, what so many read in the New Testament, but rather a model of strength and power, growing out of a 19th century movement called muscular Christianity, but, but evolving in this very kind of 20th century political way, um, very much shaped by the moment when the theology is born in the 1930s. Um, uh, to quote the current leader again, he says, uh, uh, he says, you know how Jesus said you got to put me before mother, father, brother, sister. This is in the Bible. This is true. This is uh, a scriptural citation. Here's how he interprets it. He says, Hitler, Lenin, Mao, that's what they taught the kids. Mao even had the kids killing their own parents. But it wasn't murder, you see, because it was for building the new nation, building the kingdom. Now, he's not, he's certainly not a Maoist. He's not a, he's not a Nazi. He's not saying, uh, uh, he uh, seeks to, to these ends. It's the model of strength. In fact, this is what leaders of the group would say to me. They say, no, no, it's just the methods that we admire, the methods of the strength, the idea of a leader who is strong. And that leads them out into the world. You take that as a metaphor. And defending themselves, they said, oh, we only use Hitler as a metaphor for Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that's all right, you know. Um, they say, but. Uh, and they take that onto the world, and the metaphor becomes concrete. And that's where I think um, the most useful way to think about fundamentalism um, is especially political fundamentalism, which should be differentiated from personal, uh, personal fundamentalism, um, is, is the idea of when metaphors start becoming concrete, when you start looking out into the world and seeing leaders who you feel deserve their power, uh, you, you're going to help the weak by helping the strong, whether it's by covering up an affair for Senator Ensign or Governor Sanford, or as this group went out into the world to guys like Omar Bashir and, and Sudan, um, uh, something much, much more disturbing. Um, and I just want to close with a, just a very short passage from the book. Um, uh, what I see as a sort of the most disturbing element of this, um, the extension of these ideas overseas. The book is subtitled The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. And I think the fundamentalist threat to American democracy actually doesn't happen here so much. Well, it, it does, and Mark's done a lot to document that with electoral fraud and all these kinds of things. But the threat, when we see the sort of the really, the, the most nightmare scenarios, and, and what Damon was saying, if, if these guys had the power in the United States, if Sharon Engel is elected in Nevada, as I suppose maybe, we, I guess we don't know yet, but probably will be, um, uh, would they really go to these extreme ends? And I think not all at once, and certainly most of them wouldn't want to. But these ideas, these, these ideas, when we export culture wars overseas, then we start seeing the really, uh, the worst manifestation. The, the, what I want to talk about is Uganda, um, which became the heart of this new book that began with these sex scandals. But once that had started, um, uh, the group that is, you know, you can tell is very international because they, here they are in Sudan and around the world. Um, Uganda in, in East Africa had been a real, uh, a real a base for this, this group since 1986 um, when the current uh, 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 leader came into power and they cultivated him. They, they take credit for beginning the U.S. foreign uh, aid to him. We've given billions, billions with a B of dollars to Uganda. Uganda is actually a fairly important country uh, for us. It's, it's our proxy uh, in a war with Somalia. Um, it's the base for a big military buildup in Africa. Um, 
And so they've cultivated a number of these politicians. And one, a man named David Bahati, actually is a member of parliament. And he came over uh, in the early 2000s. And he wanted to get into politics, but he didn't know how. So he came to America, and he studied in Washington. Um, he, he was impressed by John Ensign. He met John Ensign. He met Mitch McConnell. He was impressed by these men. Uh, he was especially impressed by Senator Jim Inhofe, a Republican from Oklahoma. And he wanted to take these ideas back home. And he ran, and went back home, and he ran for parliament, and he won. And when he got into parliament, he found that there's a group in Uganda, just like C Street in America, a group of politicians who get together every week and say, how can we, how can we develop a leadership led by God? How can we make our, our country a godly nation? And her, his idea was something called the anti-homosexuality bill, um, which is, uh, provides the death penalty for homosexuality. Um, seven years in prison for promotion, um, which would be what I'm doing right now, just talking about it. Uh, and three years in prison for, um, three years in prison uh, if you are heterosexual but know a gay person, a homosexual person, and don't report them within 24 hours of becoming aware of this terrible fact, three years in prison for you. It's the most draconian uh, anti-gay initiative in the world. It hasn't passed. And uh, unfortunately, we've had a problem with the American press that's sort of uh, constantly trying to reassure us that the center will always hold is telling us, oh, well, the bill has been uh, shelved. Um, only it hasn't. And even though it hasn't passed, the killing has already begun. Uh, Uganda newspaper is publishing uh, just this Sunday the second installment of a, uh, a kill list, as it was, it was called in some circles, of uh, uh, the top 100 homosexual activists in Uganda. Pictures where possible addresses, names, that kind of thing. Um, so David Bahati found out I was reporting about the family, which he thinks favorably of, and he got upset with me, and we began talking on the phone, and he invited me to come over to Uganda um, and, and see what it was really all about. And he said, I think you, know, you may disagree with me, but in the spirit of dialogue, you'll see what we're really trying to do. Um, so when someone is planning genocide invites you over for lunch, you go. <laughs> Um, because that's going to be an interesting lunch. So um, I went over and I spent a lot of time with Bahati, but I want to read just a short passage to really illustrate what's at stake uh, in this. Um, not from Bahati, but from the other side, the people who are suffering because of this. And I should say, the American politicians, uh, the Senator Inhofe's, the Senator Coburn's, um, they don't support this. Um, they don't want to see all the gay people killed. Their response to this has been, oh, well, that's not what we meant. Senator Coburn, who has said, homosexuals have infiltrated every level of government and they represent the greatest threat to American freedom. He says, but I didn't mean you should kill them. Don't, don't take it that far. My argument is not that they are, uh, not that they have done this thing, but they have created the structure, the institution that makes it possible, what I'm about to share with you. Uh, this is uh, about a, a person named Victor Mikasa, a trans man, born female, living male. Um, and his struggle. As a child, Juliet Mikasa knew she was attracted to children of the same sex. She had been raised Catholic, but had joined an American-style Pentecostal church, hoping that in the music and the dancing and the Holy Ghost, the ecstasy, she would find the resolution of her desires. But Juliet Mikasa was not skilled at leading two lives. She dressed as Victor. She couldn't think dressed like a girl. A pastor determined that she was possessed by male spirit and asked his flock to help him heal her. The exorcism took place at the altar in front of a thousand Christians. Boys and men from the church's healing ministry laying on hands and speaking in tongues as women in the pews swayed and sang for Mikasa's liberation, as the pastor called it, her freedom. They took her arms gently and then firmly, and then they held her and stripped her. Slowly, garment by garment, praying over each piece of demonically infused cloth. She had bound her breasts. They bared them. I cried, and every time I cried, they would call it liberation. They slapped her, but it was holy slapping, they said. And when she stood before them, completely naked, When she stood before them, completely naked, the men's hands roaming over her body, they said that was holy too. And then they locked her in a room and raped her for a week. This is known as a corrective, a medical procedure, a cure. When it was all over, the pastor declared that the church had freed Mikasa, and maybe in a sense it had. Victor Mikasa no longer believed there was a demon inside him. The demons were in that church. <laughs> 
Mikasa became a man and an activist determined to prevent what had happened to him from happening again. In 2003, he founded Freedom in Rome, Uganda, an LGBT rights organization. In 2005, Ugandan police, led by government officials, raided his house. They didn't find Mikasa, but a friend, Yvonne Oyu, was there. They took her down to the station. They stripped her. You look like a man, they said. We're going to prove you're a woman. It happened again. Mikasa fled, but in hiding and then in exile, he planned. The plan was not lesbian. It wasn't gay. It was human, he would say. It was a citizen's plan. Mikasa sued, and never was a lawsuit more like a gift of the spirit, the romance of the rule of law. And I close with that because it's one of the few happy endings in this book. Uh, Mikasa sued and won in this country that has set the idea of genocide on a simmer. Um, uh, there's still the rule of law, there's still due process. If they change the law and make it that you can kill gay people, that will happen. Until then, you need search warrants if you want to kick down doors. So Mikasa won um, by, uh, by very much um, not, I think, Damon points out that, that, that very good point you make, not by saying, you know, uh, we have to get rid of religion or anything like that. Mikasa happens to be a devout person, as are most of the, the gay activists in Uganda. Um, but by getting in the rough and tumble of democracy, getting into um, uh, bringing what uh, I, I end the book with quoting maybe one of the worst presidents in American history. It's not George Bush. It was James Buchanan, who was president up until 1861. You can see how well he managed things. But Buchanan had this one great quote that, that, I, that I love and come back to. Um, responding to those in his time who said, you know, what we need in Washington is more bipartisanship, uh, not, less debate, less noise, let's all get together. That very seductive idea of harmony, harmony at all costs, um, uh, uh, of quieting things down, tamping things down. And Buchanan's response was, I like the noise of democracy. I like the noise of democracy. And sometimes that noise has to be loud in Uganda, it has to be loud. And responding here in the United States, I think it has to be loud. Um, and I'll end there. Thanks very much. OK. Um, questions, and, and um, wait till I give you the mic, uh, because uh, we're taping this for the government. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Okay, hi. This is a question, I guess, for both of you, especially for Damon. Um, something that I've never quite understood about people on the far religious right is why, how it is that they, they know that they benefit from the tolerance that we have in this country because they come from historically religiously oppressed groups but they don't seem to understand very well how to apply tolerance to others. And I mean a very reductionist version of tolerance, just allowing something to exist even if you don't like it, which is something that we all, to some degree or another, learn how to do. Why is it so hard for them? Well, um, that's a hard question. It requires kind of thinking yourself into their mind. I mean, I think a lot of traditionalist religious believers believe that they have the truth, capital T truth. Um, and that is fine. The problem, though, is that uh, the world is filled with people who are all proclaiming their truths. And there's a kind of memory of, of another way where we all kind of agreed. There's a kind of haunt. Like it, I said it in my remarks about sexual traditionalism that I do think actually until a, a, you know half a century ago, America was kind of unified on these things. And so there's a kind of nostalgia for a social order in which we all just agree about the capital T truth. And so uh, some, sec some religious traditionalists find it very hard to hold on to their own religious capital T truth in a world in which other people have a different understanding of what that is. It requires a kind of uh, two layers of thinking. And I think liberal citizenship at its best 
it demands it and it's hard. It can be hard to kind of say, yes, I believe this is true and yet it's okay that my neighbor doesn't believe that and, and, and it's okay not to kill him and, and, and we'll, we'll settle this when we die, when we, you know, figure it, when we sort it all out. Um, some, there's, uh, there's a temptation to want to kind of solve that problem and simplify it and just make it so that we all agree. And uh, it's, it's an illiberal desire, I think. Um, I think the, the good news to me on that is that I think a lot of religious fundamentalists don't actually have a problem understanding that. I mean, even look at C Street, some of the best investigative reporting on this organization is coming from a far, far right magazine called World Magazine, um, which unlike more establishment press says, this is a problem. You're, you're, you're taking the gospel and saying it justifies doing things in secret and comparing Jesus to Hitler, and that's, we don't really like that because we're Christians. Um, and they're responding, they're bringing that noise of democracy, but I also think um, on the, the sort of the larger uh, sense of this, um, I met, met several years ago uh, uh, a friend and I spent about a year traveling around the country just sort of exploring the varieties of religious experience in America for a book. And the one thing that we found, and, and wherever we were, whether it was a, a Buddhist community or the many, many fundamentalist churches where we spent time, um, uh, first because we were two guys, we were from New York, a lot of people just assumed we were a couple, which we weren't. But we just sort of let that ride to see what would happen. And even in the most fundamentalist churches, where they're really homophobic, yeah, but there we were at their doorstep. So they would, there, would, there was this hospitality there. And the reason they would explain that was because they, they believed deeply in free speech. And they said, free speech is an ideal that's in the Bible. No, it's not, actually. It's not. And this is this kind of this great American contribution to the world history of religion. All these believers believing in free speech, not always practicing it so well, but believing in it. And I think that's very, very encouraging. And I think that's a kind of, that's a part of small d democratic fundamentalist tradition that you can appeal to. And, and I agree with that. I've got a question for Damon Linker and then a follow-up with uh, Jeff. And you said, uh, let's have a conversation. And the question that I want to pose in practical terms is uh, how you would recommend we go about that for the simple uh, observation that there appears to be a strident and confrontational tone in both the American dialogue and what would be considered a, a broader non-political secular dialogue. The idea of disagreeing disagreeably mm -hmm. um, is sort of a, a meritorious end in itself in some ways of thinking or not thinking. Yeah. So um, especially when uh, there appears to be, um, uh, there appears to be some regressive value systems that challenge from the traditional side our notions of, um, of civil rights and civil liberties. Um, how do you propose we initiate and sustain that conversation? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, practically speaking, um, I think that uh, a good place to start would be with presidential elections. As I, I talk about in, in the epilogue to the book, that there's a kind of relationship between the higher you go in political office, uh, that these questions become more, more and more pressing. There are some issues that have to do just, just with citizenship, as I talked about, that you know, if you reject the findings of evolutionary biology, then there's no telling you know, what you're gonna make of data on you know, public schools and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so that's a problem for all citizens. But if we just say start with, all right, if we're talking about who we're gonna elect as president, then why don't we say devote a presidential debate solely to religion and morals? Um, now, one possibility uh, uh, form this Rick Warren debate that he did with Obama and McCain in 2008, I don't think he did a particularly good job of it, but something along those lines. So say if we're going to have three debates, one of them will be about morals and religion, and you'll have religious leaders and uh, secular figures, uh, journalists, uh, in a panel posing interesting, uh, inform hopefully informative questions of political candidates about the place of their faith in their, uh, in their, uh, in their political campaigns and in their identities. As Jeff noted, um, I mean, the kind of backdrop to my book is essentially if we didn't have a movement in America that explicitly says that politicians should bring religion into politics, 
I wouldn't have written my book. I wouldn't think that we need to have a debate like that. But we do have a movement, namely the religious right, that tells politicians that they should put their religion front and center. Given that fact, let's raise the question and, and pose the tough question. So that would be, practically speaking, where it could be done. And it should be done with respect. As I said earlier, we shouldn't ask questions about whether Mormons wear undergarments unless you could come up with a way to, you know, to think about why that would matter what Mitt Romney had on under his clothes. I mean, normally we don't care what politicians wear under their clothes, so I would say it doesn't matter. But his view of the prophet in Salt Lake City does matter. That's interesting. It's politically uh, important to settle that question. And I think it could be done in a way that's respectful. Yes, um, for, for, for Jeff Schellert. Uh One of the things that's important about the work that you've done, both as a reporter and as a writer, and I make a distinction between the two for the simple reason that the work of reportage, um, specifically looking at archival historical context and then putting it within a framework of what's happening in public policy, um, is I think very different from the work that you've done as a writer, but complementary, that actually humanizes the characters that you're writing about, um, both the deluded and those who are um, seeking liberation from that delusion. But um, I have a question for you about a sort of practical thing. The subtitle of your book is about the threat to democracy. And um, one of the things that I was hoping you could speak to is that there seems to have been uh, the evidence seems to support that there's a direct correlation between two things that are related to how we conduct democracy. One has to do with, um, uh, in some ways, a sort of um, anti-science, um, anti-reason bias that has directly affected um, health policy. Uh, which has to do with how we spend our money and also has to do with issues of being able to control uh, communicable diseases and manage um, uh, the, uh, the issues of disease internationally as well as nationally. Um, and the other has to do with this issue of um, what could be considered a sort of um, shadow or parallel foreign policy um, where there seems to be a foreign policy conducted under the auspices of the American government, but sometimes in direct contradiction to what's been legislated or with what's coming out of either one of the two houses or out of the White House. And so I'm hoping you can speak to the consequences um, or what you've discovered in terms of the consequences of this affecting health policy, um, public policy internationally, and also what seems like, and I may be wrong, um, a sort of parallel or shadow foreign policy. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's a very good point actually to, to focus on on disease and the response to disease and, and health policy because that gets in that that invariably gets morally coded um, uh, and you know the beginning of uh, not the beginning but the the sort of the real turning point where the Uganda relationship uh, turned awful because it wasn't always awful the relationship between this group and Uganda was when a number of politicians started using Uganda as a test case in which to um, try and promote health policy, um, specifically abstinence-only sex education. That they couldn't really, I mean, they, they, they made some inroads in the United States, they weren't getting that far. So um, Uganda was completely dependent on the US, especially for anti-AIDS money, and they started pouring money uh, into ministries and Uganda, and they decided to take a program that had worked pretty well, abstinence, be faithful, and condoms. Um, and Uganda had actually turned around its AIDS rate, its AIDS rate uh, which was very unusual in the world at the time, which was tremendously high, and they had it going down. Um, a group of politicians connected this said, well, let's take condoms out, including, by the way, John Ensign. John Ensign, no condoms for, for, for Uganda. Um, uh, and that became promoted. And then, I mean, you go back and look at the congressional record, and you look at those abstinence debates that we had here, um, you see these guys citing, well, in the case study of Uganda, we see that um, they didn't use condoms and they turned the AIDS rate around, which is bad science, false, and, you know, uh, just shy of murderous in, in, in a sense. Um, the AIDS rate in Uganda went back up, um, and in the United States, you know, we still have abstinence-only education. That didn't go away with Bush. Um, in fact, that keeps getting refunded. But just that point that you make, that, that, that in tracing these ideas, it's worth sort of looking for the parallel and, and, and health policy, I think, is a good one. The foreign policy, the news there is, I think, actually not quite as bad. I wouldn't call it a, a shadow foreign policy. 
Um, when you take someone like Senator Coburn who, uh, or Senator Inhofe using taxpayer money going over to, to, to foreign leaders and saying, I want to talk to you about Jesus, Coburn went over to the leadership of Lebanon and said, I have the solution for the Middle East crisis. You all just have to become followers of Jesus. Um, he said this, by the way, arriving in Lebanon accompanied by a big shipment of U.S. tanks as part of a $410, military, $410 million military aid package we were going. That's not a shadow foreign policy. That's hijacking foreign policy. Um, that wasn't the intention. And, and you know, you talk to State Department folks about this, and it, it drives them nuts. And then it's the last point I would make on that is I don't want to give American foreign policy too much credit. It's not like it was that great to begin with, and then these guys <laughs> mess it up. What the family does, they don't, you know, they don't forge relationships with countries that we weren't, that the United States wasn't going to be working with anyways. What they do is they make the politicians who are involved feel good about it. Um, they turn real politique into sort of a dream politique, where where you, when you send tanks abroad, you feel like you're doing God's work, and um, it's a way of suppressing the questions, of quieting, quieting the debate, and, and bringing it into that kind of quieter place. Um, so, I guess two-part question for both of you, uh, for Jeff. My understanding of the family is that they believe that the United States is a patriarchy and should be one, and yet it seems that the superstars in their world are these women. And we're looking at potentially a Palin presidency in 2012, so the question is, how would they really feel about that? Would she really be allowed to have autonomy in that world? Would she have to recognize some kind of male authority? And then my question to Damon is, what are the questions that she needs to answer, not just as an evangelical, but as an evangelical woman who craves power? Um, you know, the family's not monolithic, and they don't like Sarah Palin, and Sarah Palin doesn't like them. Um, they don't like Mike Huckabee either, um, because there's class. Class is a reality. I mean, they represent a kind of an elite, very kind of upper crust, insidery kind of strain of politics. They think Sarah Palin is tacky for some reason. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of sort of tension, and, and, and much sharper even with Mike Huckabee for, for the, very, the very same reasons, although that's not a gender issue. But the gender th way they deal with that, um, they do have this, I the, in the inner circle has this idea of male headship that as Christ is to his followers, so men are to women in, uh, in their lives. Nonetheless, um, uh, uh, they say we work with power where we can, build new power where we can't. They're interested in women in power because they're interested in things as they are. And they begin relating to those women. They begin essentially gendering them male and treating them um, in the same way that they would treat men. Uh, and as apart from, uh, you know, the leader of the group, Doug Coe, 600 boxes of documents. I spent years looking at this. There may be, I didn't see every page, but there might be. The only mention of his wife I could find was a tribute paid to her um, because she, she was so good at waiting in the car while he was off talking with politicians. Um, and sometimes those politicians would be women. The women he was talking to were gendered men, and that's how they dealt with it. Meanwhile, his wife was to wait in the car. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the question about what questions Palin should answer, uh, it's actually, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, she's a Pentecostal. Uh, so the two main kind of uh, categories of questions would have to do, uh, once again, with uh, evolution. Uh, do you accept the findings of evolutionary biology? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, in other words, a, a discussion like uh, my radio host from uh, my interview wanted to have. Uh, I'd love to hear if Sarah Palin believes that dinosaurs roamed the earth at the time of Marco Polo, if she's ever heard of Marco Polo. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, the other thing is, is it has to do with American providence, which I mentioned in passing. Um, uh, and here, I think there, there really is reason to believe that she, she might think these things. Uh, does she believe that God is directly guiding America's actions in the world, perhaps toward uh, a very close to imminent uh, kind of final battle of human history in the Middle East? Does she believe we're on the edge of, uh, on the verge of the end times? Uh, what role does she believe Israel might be playing in this? Uh, how might this influence her, her view of uh, the Middle East and our role in it? Um, again, very straightforward. You'd think like this is the most obvious thing in the world if a Pentecostal, devout Pentecostal walked in and said, hi, I I'm going to run to be president of the United States. The first thing 
thing I would want to know is that. And yet, as, as Jeff mentioned, and as I talk about in the introduction to my book, ever since Kennedy was asked some tough questions about his Catholicism, and he responded by saying, how dare you ask those questions, but let me answer them for you anyway. Um, as, as, since he said that, uh, the press has kind of decided to give a pass. They'll, be, they'll ask very tough questions about religion in general. But when it comes time to say, actually, you're a Pentecostal, many Pentecostals believe X, Y, and Z. Do you believe X, Y, and Z? Then suddenly reporters get all scared that they're going to sound like they're being intolerant. And my attitude is that's not intolerant. That's treating religion with respect. You say you believe these things. Do you? What, what will it mean? Again, shoes dropping. You know, if well, what happens if um, uh, I don't know if if uh, Hezbollah <laughs> takes over Lebanon completely and invades Israel from the north? What should be the response? Is that a sign that uh, you know that Jesus is coming back in about 12 hours, or is it simply uh, a matter of trying to decide you know allies and interests, the t the typical things that uh, that a foreign policy thinker would would bring in? Is there a theological dimension to it? That's what I would want to ask. I, I want to just weigh in on this because there's a presumption to your question that I think needs to be addressed. And it has to do with your questions about democracy. Um, this being election day, it's appropriate to point this out. There is no way that Sarah Palin could ever be authentically elected president. She drove voters away from John McCain. She was extremely unpopular even with Republicans. She could, however, win. And this has to do not with the fact that she could woo the electorate successfully. She couldn't. Uh, it has to do with the fact that this movement that these men have written about uh, has essential control of the voting system in the, in, in the United States. And this is the subject of another book, I suppose, that someone ought to write. Uh, that means me, I suppose, because nobody wants to talk about it. But, for example, the two largest electronic voting machine companies, ES&S and Diebold, were originally one company called American Information Systems. That company was founded by two brothers named Bob and Todd Urasevich, who were a couple of foaming at the mouth Oklahoma Christianist theocrats. They didn't start this business because they thought it would be a way to get rich. They got into this business because they don't believe in democracy. This movement is extremely hostile to democracy. They don't believe that the majority is clean enough and right enough with God to rule now, AIS split into Diebold and es and s and each one is run by one of these two brothers. The man who fixed the elections for Bush Cheney from 2009 was a guy named Mike Connell, who was a fervent traditionalist Catholic, whose motivation for helping them steal elections was, in his own words, to save the babies. Okay, this is a long and complicated story. You guys can do a Google search on the name Mike Connell when you go home. Suffice it to say that uh, a few weeks after he was deposed in a courtroom just before Election Day 2008, his, his uh, plane crashed as he was flying home from College Park to Akron. Just the other day, Karl Rove was served with a subpoena to be asked questions about his relationship to this guy. Uh, camera crews for CNN and CBS were there and, and saw him take the subpoena. It's been reported nowhere. But I, I can't really think of a more important um, subject vis-a-vis -vis the Christian right than its, con its literal control of, of the nation's voting system. I, I don't expect you to say anything to this. I just felt that I had to weigh in on it. Um, Matthew, you had a question. Right, I did have a question. Let me just remember what it was. Okay, for both of you guys, um, one of the ideas that you hear on the religious right is that the idea that the liberal state is neutral with respect to their religion is a myth, right? They think that this liberal state is aggressively out to undermine them and destroy their religion. So do you think that's true? And given what you've said, don't you think it would be a good idea? Uh, I don't think it's true. I do think it's true that they think that. That's very clearly the case. Um, you know, they have a point sometimes. Uh, there are cases where the liberal state sometimes oversteps its boundaries. I think I do talk in the book about uh, there's a very, very uh, – tense relationship, especially with education. That's why we have the homeschooling movement. 
In my opinion, uh, the public school should be very cautious in pushing an actual comprehensive ideology of secularism in the schools. Uh, I think that uh, when they do do that, uh, then the religious right has a point. And I mean interdenominational religious right. I mean, like, I, I think it, there's no easy uh, adjudicating of these things. They're debates, they go back and forth. Uh, and there are good debates on either side, but I do think that when the public schools uh, see their role as trying to essentially say, if you come into the school being a traditionalist believer, that that's just ignorance, and we, by the time you come out, you'll be secular. Uh, to the extent that a school does that, that's, that's going too far, and it provokes the exodus into the homeschooling movement. Uh, by the same token, if you have a, a, a young woman who's being abused by her father because he says that the, you know, that the Bible or the Quran says that he's allowed to be doing that, then the school has to intervene. So there's no, there's no absolute way of drawing the line there. But both sides have to be cautious. But in, at its best, the liberal state does not take an anti-religious uh, point of view. It, it does strive for neutrality, even if it often uh, falls uh, even if it falls short in one one uh, extreme or the other, that's at least my view of it. Um, I think if you do want to destroy religion, the liberal state is really not a very good bet. Um, and I, I guess I'm persuaded in, in, in the sort of the critique of there's a group of theologians called radical orthodoxy who would argue that uh, liberalism. Uh, is, is very much kind of an outgrowth of, of essentially a Protestant idea. Um, uh, and it perpetuates it. And I think then people say, but look at Europe. Look what happens in Europe. And maybe that could happen here. I think that argument ignores history. There's a lot of reasons why America is this incredibly religious nation and, and Europe is seemingly ever more uh, uh, non-religious. Um, uh, and I think it also sort of, to me, to me it misses it misses the point. I mean, my, my problem with Sam Brownback or Jim Inhofe is not that they're devout. My problem is that they say things like gay people are the greatest threat to democracy. Um, uh, I end the book with a fundamentalist preacher um, who happens to be anti-gay but would never, never legislate it. In fact, the leading activist in this Uganda thing is a fundamentalist Christian. Um, who uh, I disagree completely with his ideas, but he is the leading anti-gay gay rights activist in the world, and he has done more to uh, push back, not just in Uganda, but on anti-gay coercion in the United States. So you see that, I mean, even that, that, that point you said, you know, the questions you asked Sarah Palin about her Pentecostalism and about evolution and, and creation, I always think that question has to be followed up, because what do you conclude from your belief in creationism? I think of William Jennings Bryan, remember from the Scopes Monkey Trial. Um, and there's an idea that he represented the religious right and Clarence Darrow was the left. The tragedy of that, of that, the whole debate about evolution was that that was a clash of two, I don't want to say left or progressive, but two great liberationist ideas. He opposed evolution partly because he said, you know, if we keep teaching this, uh, someone's going to come up with an idea like eugenics. Um, the, the textbook he opposed, the textbook that was the, the evolution textbook that he opposed, in fact taught that in the future uh, we may get rid of uh, mentally retarded people, and that that's something we learned from this. So he had a good reason to oppose that. Um, I, I don't care what they believe, I care what they do and what they act upon, and there are people who will come from very religious places but will bring to the public debate a prophetic challenge like Martin Luther King, or like the religious leaders who are fighting this thing in Uganda. I don't want them to go away. Um, and I think they're actually a challenge to the liberal state, too, because the liberal state suggests this consensus, and the prophetic voice is always going to be outside of the consensus. All righty. Um, this was really terrific. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, but don't applaud yet. Hold the applause. Tomorrow night, um, I'm going to be, they've asked me to host a special event with Matt Taby of Rolling Stone, whose new book, Griftopia, is just out. So uh, if you want to come back, I'll see you then. Next month, first Tuesday, we're doing a book by Barbie Zelizer called About to Die, which is about news photographs of people who are about to die. And it is a fascinating book. We'll be here every uh, first Tuesday of every month, and you can keep up with the schedule by going to the uh, bookstores website.
let me simply conclude by urging you again to buy copies of uh, C Street and The Religious Test and having them signed by the authors. What a thrilling prospect that is. And uh, thank you very much for coming, and thanks to both our terrific guests. <laughs>